Hi there and welcome to Where's the Money Gone, a podcast about football finance, governance and politics with me, Adrian Goldberg. I'm an investigative journalist, West Bromwich Albion season ticket holder, joined by Charlie Methven. Charlie is Charlton Athletics co-owner, former director of Sunderland, one-time advisor to Tottenham Hotspur, a boyhood Oxford United fan to boot as well. Loads to go at this week. We're going to talk about Leicester and Chelsea's skirmishes with profit and sustainability rules, Aston Villa's hugely controversial Champions League pricing and the new women's football season. Football-wise, though, this weekend, a bit of disappointment for you, Charlie. Yeah, a one-all draw for the mighty Addicts against Rotherham United. You're still in the playoff zone, of course. Yeah, I, th- I think, you know, over the course of the season, you're, you're going to have plenty of games that don't entirely go your way. Um, and yesterday against one of the teams that would be thought of as one of our promotion rivals, Rotherham, who perennially <clears throat> bounce between... The championship in League One, seeming seemingly like a sort of yo, y- the archetypal yo-yo club, um, with that wily old manager Steve Evans in charge. That's never going to be a straightforward match at this level. Um, it always turns into an arm wrestle. Um, ball tends to not spend that much time in play. Um, there tend to be an awful lot of lengthy um, injury breaks um, and water breaks and all this type of stuff. Type of game that is a is the ultimate banana skin so it would have been great to have won it it would have been a, you know having beaten Bolton my other rivals a couple of weeks ago it would have been great to have stuck one over on Rotherham as well but if you can't win them let's not get beat and um, we conjured up a fantastic equaliser just couldn't quite get the winning goal but overall 10 points in the first five games you'd take that um, and we, we we roll on hopefully to some slightly more straightforward games coming forward well, indeed. Good luck to you on those. And uh, West Brom weren't in action this weekend because of the international break. I went to see one of my local non-league sides, Cadbury Athletic, who play in Bourneville in Birmingham against a team called Birmingham United, the visitors, who won 5-1. But it was actually a very good game of football, Midland Alliance Division 2. So uh, I was doing my bit to keep grassroots football alive as well. Really enjoyed my afternoon at a lovely old ground that was uh, built, or the pavilion was built in 1902. But I think because of various covenants on the ground, they kind of have floodlights as well, which I think is a shame. But it's a, it's a lovely place uh, to watch football. Let's talk then about big time Premier League football. And Leicester City, Charlie, avoided a penalty for overspending in the three years to the end of the 2022-3 season when they were in the Premier League. Their losses were £129 million. That's in excess of the £105 million over three years. But an independent panel said that they had broken no rules. How come? Well, um, there's a very straightforward answer to that. They had broken no rules because more by luck than design, although they at the time doubtless saw it that way, I doubt they did see it that way rather, had got relegated to the championship. And what had happened was is they changed their accounting period to uh, the end of June, which is in line with most football clubs. That's a totally normal thing. Um, and that then meant that by the time that the, um, the period under discussion had finished, they were no longer members of the Premier League. Indeed, their share in the Premier League had been passed to Luton Town. So what then happened was the Premier League said, well, you've overspent by this amount of money over that period of time, whatever it was, around around about £20 million. Um, And therefore, we are going to give you a points deduction when you reappear in the Premier League. You broke our rules when you were last here. You're now going to get points deduction when you reappear in our league and therefore come back under our jurisdiction. Leicester um, then say, well... uh, but I'm not sure that's quite right, because the final year that you're judging us on, by the time that our accounts were published, we were no longer members of your organisation. So you have to discount that year. That year is a year which, which, when we became under the championship's jurisdiction. So this very tight piece of um, definition became the basis for their appeal. Now, just to give you an idea of how sort of tight it is, effectively, the year that finished on June the 30th, of course, they they only lost their Premier League share effectively one month before the end of that financial year. So it's a very um, sort of uh, 
difficult case for them to argue on moral grounds. They definitely did lose that money during the time in the Premier League. And presumably they had no intention of getting relegated from the Premier League. But in retrospect, their lawyers have dredged this one month um, sort of uh, hiatus up as a reason to say on a technical basis, we haven't broken your rules. And you know what? I think most clubs, obviously, in that situation would try and use whatever they can within the rule book, which would get them off the hook. And I don't really have a problem with that. You know, ultimately, the fault is with the rule book, not with the club that is trying to say, well, that is your rule book. I think the thing that slightly sticks in the craw is the rather sanctimonious public statements. We've done nothing wrong. We knew all along that we were doing this absolute balderdash. They did not want to get relegated from the Premier League. They didn't know until quite late on that they were going to get relegated from the Premier League. By the time these losses have been baked in by overspending on players, they the die was cast. If they had been successful that season, then they would have got a big points deduction. So I think that's that's the bit which for me really is a sort of, you know, if, if you're a classy organisation, what you should say in those circumstances is, look, as per the rule book, we are actually technically not guilty. But we recognise that some people will look at this and say that that's a rather technical thing. And we are, now, we are now getting our house in order. We are now making sure that we no longer have to, to rely on small intricacies of the rule book going forward. We are going to be a club that properly abides by the rules, does things properly, is run properly, etc. And I think most people then look at it and say, OK, fine, let's move on. There's a lot of talk in football just about how sort of classless the whole attempt in public statements to try and imply that somehow they were in the right all along and they haven't done anything wrong, etc. Um, the Football League themselves, funny enough, have come out in a rare moment of unity with the Premier League and have said how um, how deplorable the situation is. And I think that moving forward, Leicester are not out of the woods. And this is where their classless behaviour might really come to sort of bite them in a way, because um, what, what the Premier League did last year is that they changed their rules to say that even if you are out of the Premier League for one season, you will then be judged over the next two years, including that year, but on an average basis, effectively. Now, if you look at what they are, are uh, what they were losing in the year before they went down and what they are projected to lose this year, then there is a strong possibility. I only say a possibility, but there is a strong possibility they could fall foul of the regulations again. And this time they will not get off. And I don't and I think if they didn't get off, there would not be a huge amount of sympathy washing around the game and the industry, given the way in which they've treated this uh, this little loophole. And we stress they are within the rules. That's what the independent Absolutely. panel found. Yeah. They have done nothing illegal. But the independent panel, he said, itself said that the, the profit and sustainability rules are in relevant parts far from well-drafted. So the Premier League's rules, as you say were rubbish, weren't they? They were really poorly drafted. I think Leicester, they changed their accounting period right. not long before that relegation season either. I think it was quite near the end of that year. So that's correct. Whether they were aware that this might provide them with the opportunity to make this argument when the writing was on the wall, who can know? But nevertheless, they were in the rules. But the Premier League itself says... If the appeal board is correct, and they're not going to appeal it as we understand it, its decision will have created a situation where any club exceeding the PSR threshold could avoid accountability in those specific circumstances. Now, I would say to you, Charlie, this absolutely goes back to the original sin of modern football, which is the creation of the Premier League. You've got two different jurisdictions, the Premier League and the EFL, and wealthy clubs with clever lawyers can find loopholes. That's not how football should be run. It stinks to high heaven to me. Yeah, well, I mean, look, it, it, it does. Um, and I think it's interesting that the Football League and the Premier League are bemoaning at the same time, effectively, the, the, the separation of the jurisdictions. Um, I think that with the creation of the football regulator, which will bring certain types of regulation in regards to football under one, one roof, um, and with the incoming UEFA SCRs, which start to move towards a system which is the same pretty much throughout throughout football in terms of um, uh, sort of rules regarding spending. Um, we and are, SCRs right, are what, Charlie? SCRs these are? are the squad, these are the squad cost ratios, which means that you can only 
spend a certain percentage of your revenues, and we'll come on to the difference between revenues and P&L, um, in a, or, or sorry, and, and, and a sort of accounting profit and loss in, in a moment, I, I suspect, as regards another club. But um, once everyone's operating roughly off the same scheme, once everybody's coming under the sort of the realm of a single football governance body, the football regulator, which hopefully will be imposed quite soon. And we're also looking forward to a situation where it's likely that the Premier League will be handing future TV rights sales on behalf of the whole of English football. I think maybe, just maybe, we are starting to move towards a slightly less sclerotic universe. Yeah, well, a cynic, and I'm one of those in this regard, might say that the Premier League rules were drafted poorly because the Premier League itself has not been sufficiently interested in making sure that clubs stay within its own spending rules. The rules have been there because pressure has been brought upon clubs, not least by supporters, not least by politicians, to ensure that clubs don't spend money that they haven't got. But I would argue that the Premier League hasn't been sufficiently interested in that to draw tight rules about this. And that's why it's come back to bite them on the backside. And the Premier League can only look at itself for the situation that it finds itself in. I think it's I, disgraceful, albeit entirely legal. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I agree, actually. I, I think that for the last few years, the Premier League has been very interested in in um, cost control. Um, and to, to, much to the um, horror of some people, I mean, I, occasionally, I pick up the Sunday Times occasionally and read their benighted columnist, Martin Samuel, who seems to think that actually it'd be extremely good for the game if everyone was allowed to spend as much as they possibly could with no restrictions whatsoever, no care about going bust in the future, doesn't matter at all. Oddly enough, the following week, he bemoaned the lack of English owners in the game without seeming to understand there aren't very many English owners who can keep up spending with a Saudi sovereign state. Um, <laughs> uh, there's an awful lot of cant and hypocrisy around these topics. I think that over the last few years, the Premier League has tried to put its house in order, but ultimately it's not really a regulator, it's a members club. And that's the thing to remember, is that the executive, which does speak with politicians, which does speak with UEFA and all these types of stuff, ultimately they have to bring things back for the approval of their own clubs, who are exactly the same organisations that in theory are going to be prosecuted under the rules. So it's a very difficult thing. And I think that once these things come under respectively UEFA and the football the, the football regulator, the, the government football regulator, and it's taken out of the hands of the membership clubs are the EPL and the EFL, I think we'll be in a much better place. Before we move on from Leicester, I just want to observe that the ruling in which they were declared to have broken no rules applied to the 2022-23 season, but we still have then questions around the 23-24 season when they got promoted from the championship in the eyes of many observers having a, a very large squad of highly paid players. So is there the possibility of either sanction from the EFL or going forward from the Premier League relating to that season in the EFL? Can that be brought but together? Well, yeah, possibly so, but it'll, it'll most likely be from the Premier League based on, as I said earlier on, the, the change in its rules that it put across last summer which allows them to say, well, if you are in the Premier League for two out of three seasons, we can sort of take the third season and average it out. So instead of being allowed to lose 105 million quid over three years, you're allowed to lose 85 million quid over two years, and we can get you on that if you if you if you've exceeded that. Um, so we sh we shall wait and see. But as I said, I don't think they've made many friends, not just by the exploitation of a loophole, which I think a lot of people would understand, but the way in which they've talked about it has been sort of caused by a bad smell in the industry. Let's talk about the basket case that is Chelsea. I say that from a footballing point of view. Anybody who's an observer of Chelsea's comings and goings over the summer, and really since Todd Bowley took over, effectively the day-to-day the -day running of the club will just have giant question marks popping out of their heads about how Chelsea is being managed. But there was a curious thing in the last few days, in that Chelsea sold two hotels effectively to itself, to its own holding company. The income from the sale of those two hotels has been allowed to be counted as an offset against profit and sustainability. So they've been able to balance that against this 
apparently profligate spending spree that they've been undergoing for the last couple of years. As I understand it, though, the sale of those two hotels, even though the Premier League have allowed it, would not be permissible as an offset under UEFA rules. What's going on? Well, this has been flagged up for some time as being one of the many ways in which Chelsea might s- manage to slide their way underneath the um, uh, the, the PSR um, sort of poll, um, if you can imagine it. Um, and uh, I actually think this one is much more legitimate um, under the current PSR rules, which do relate to profit and loss for a club as opposed to revenue-based spending. So clearly the sale of a capital asset not really revenue as such it is um, a capital realization and would sit on the balance sheet as such um but what it definitely does do obviously is contribute to that year's um loss or profit but in this case loss um just in the same way that sell of a player would do because effectively when you look at the balance sheet of a football club you'll see that, that on the balance sheet will be the property the club owns on the one hand and will be the players the club owns on the other hand and various other bits and bobs here and there etc so the realization of one of those assets into cash in one year, I think is is legitimate. Now, a lot of other clubs, by the way, in the past, particularly in the EFL, have done this by selling their own stadium to themselves. And I think that that was a bit stinky. That was a bit stinky. But hotels are, are external assets fundamentally, and there's no particular reason why Chelsea should hold hotels. They're not hoteliers. Um, and these things were built back in the day of Ken Bates when he was trying to sort of you know, get more money together and sort of get things going at Chelsea, et cetera, et cetera. But they're worth an awful lot of money now and they're not hoteliers. So I don't really see any problem with them selling it. Now, onto the question of why that would not be allowable under UEFA rules. UEFA rules stipulates what it regards as revenue against which to judge the 70% of revenue which you're allowed to spend on players. But effectively, the revenue has to be repeating sort of revenue. It has to be the kind of revenue that happens every year so that you don't get big spikes up and down in terms of what clubs are, 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 aren't allowed to spend. So this would be regarded as outside of normal revenue and therefore outside of the 70% and therefore would not be allowable under UEFA's new rules, which are effectively going through a sort of pilot one year right now prior to being imposed next year. So it's absolutely right for Chelsea to get the sale of these hotels away right now, get that done, pass PSR, make sure you don't get a points deduction which prevents you getting into Europe next year. And then they're going to have to look quite hard about how they're going to slide under the the 70% UEFA rules next year. Um, That is going to be a really interesting exercise given just how many players they have on their books on massive wages without being in the Champions League with, with the revenue currently that that engenders. Yeah, just so we're clear on what's happened with the hotels then. They were sold by Chelsea FC Holdings to Blueco 22 Properties Limited, but both companies on either side of that transaction are under the control of Todd Bowley and Clear Lake Capital, who are Chelsea's owners. I hear what you say, Charlie, that it's something that Chelsea engaged in as a company and cost them money at the outset, and it's therefore an asset that they have now realised, and it's within the rules. I accept that it's within the rules, but I've got to say, as a fan, I prefer UEFA's rules, because I I just think it it just means, doesn't it, that clubs have this stuff sitting on their balance sheets. It allows them to effectively subvert the intention of the Premier League's profit and sustainability rules, accepting that it's within those rules, but the intention is to make sure that clubs are only spending money on transfers and wages in a way that is sustainable. And massive one-off infusions of capital like this are not sustainable. Well, this is this is why the PSR rules are so hopeless and why they have to be got rid of and why the the incoming UA for SCR rules are so much better and why the, the the application of those rules in the Football League needs to be tightened up. Um, once everybody is on squad cross ratio rules, and once all of this stuff is ruled out of court right from the start, then everybody will be in a much clearer, better position. It's PSR that's the problem here. It's not, I, I don't judge, I don't, unlike with Leicester, 
where they didn't mean to get relegated from the Premier League and then they fiddled around with their accounting rules and then it's exploded. I don't regard this as being a loophole. Under PSR, this is legitimate, in my view. This is entirely legitimate. They flagged it up well in advance. As you say, it's an asset the club had spent money on. Now it's an asset that's being sold. Doubtless, once it's been sold to the holding company, the holding company will probably then sell them on to a hotel operator of some kind. In my mind, this is legitimate. Um, I, I am somewhat interested, given that that, that holding company is co-owned, as you say, by... Um, Todd Bowley and Co. and Clear Lake Capital, given what seems to be happening behind the scenes between those two entities, that would be interesting to see how that gets, you know, dealt with, divided up. Um, if there is uh, a passing of the ways between those entities, as is being sort of mooted in the media at the moment. But as things currently stand in the final year of PSR, I think this is not something that we want to get too hot, hot under the collar about. And in terms of Todd Bowley and Clear Lake Capital, then these are Chelsea's US owners, but a suggestion that there is not unanimity behind the scenes at Chelsea. What what can we make of that? Do you know what? It's 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 it's, a, it's an interesting thing, right? Because it's quite difficult um to manage and run a football club with multiple shareholders. Um now this is something that I've been involved with several times now. Um, and in theory, this is how normal companies run, right? So a normal company, whether it be a privately held company or a publicly held stock company, um, will have more than one shareholders. There are exceptions, there are family businesses, et cetera, but majority, significant size businesses will have multiple shareholders. And those multiple shareholders mandate um, the executives to run the club on their behalf and the executives report back into the shareholders let them know how they're getting on. And if ultimately a majority of the shareholders don't think the executives are doing a good enough job, then the executives get fired and the whole thing sort of moves on from there. That's how a normal company works. The problem about football is its beauty. The beauty of football is that everyone has an opinion about it. The problem about that is when it comes to the running of a football club is that when it comes to what I would say the juicier bits of that, which is, you know, which players to sign, which managers to hire and fire and all that type of stuff, what you'll find is, is that it isn't just the fans who've got an opinion, but it's individual shareholders who have got an opinion as well. And when one of the shareholders seems to have more of a say in the making of those decisions, if those decisions then don't go well, then the other shareholders who might have had a contrary view in the first place start to say, well, hang on a second, mate. You've just lost us a lot of money with that decision. You know, that decision that you made that I didn't agree with at the time has just lost us a lot of money. And the and the relationship can become fractious from there. Um now, it's, it's, it is very much a matter of football. One of my owners is fond of saying that, you know, if this was a light bulb factory, no, none of the shareholders would be particularly interested in um, in the sort of ins and outs of how the light bulbs are made, etc. Et they would just look purely at it as an investment and see what the dividend return on the increase in capital return might be and, and all this type of stuff. But because it's football, because people have a view, it can become difficult. Now, what it looks like has happened here is that obviously when this whole project started, Burley was in charge and Burley was calling the shots when it came to those juicy decisions about who to fire, who to hire, which players to sign and all this type of stuff. And he was very prominent. And in that year or two that he really was in charge, it didn't, certainly in the short term, it didn't come off. And therefore the bigger entity in that partnership, Clear Lake Capital, who probably had no intention of running the club in the first place, a private equity firm, so why would they? probably looking in from the sidelines going, have we pinned our colours to the right mast here? Does this chap Burley actually know what he's doing when it comes to running a football club? Clearly he's been involved in running other sports clubs before, but not a football club. And you start to get that slightly sort of fractious relationship in the, in, in the boardroom where it's like, well, you've just lost me a lot of money. You know, should we allow you to keep on doing this? Now, I don't know if you then noticed, but then the, the guys behind um, Clear Lake then started to take more of a forward role. They started to have a sort of more decision-making role and Burley started to move more into the background. And let's just say that some of the decisions that they've made haven't necessarily yet come to um, be enorm regarded as enormously successful. And you've probably got a bit of Burley in the background if I was Burley saying, well, you know, you, you guys thought it was all going to be so easy, but actually I was on the right tracks and you sort of stopped me heading in that, in that direction to a degree or whatever it might be. And you start to get these slightly fractious relationships. Now, under those circumstances, what normally happens is either the whole thing is sold because the parties can't agree and they agree to disagree and say, let's sell, sell the whole thing, or else one of the parties buys out the other parties. Um, and from the mood music in the media, it looks like um, 
Burley is ready to sell on the basis he's no longer in control of the club in terms of operationally and therefore as an individual, private individual with private wealth invested in it, effectively now his private wealth's future is being dictated to by a bunch of private equity people. And it looks to me like Clear Lake is saying, well, you know, we don't need to buy you out, but, you know, might be. and then you start to get into the positioning of, well, you know, I'd be very happy to buy you out. Bodhi can say clearly, you know, if you want to go, et cetera, et cetera. There's a bit of positioning, there's a bit of an arm wrestle. And at some point, there's some sort of price agreement reached and the whole thing goes on. But once you start to see these rumors occurring in the media, it very rarely ends in the whole situation sort of coming sweet and some light again. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, Clear Lake owns 61.5% of the club. Todd Bowley owns 38.5%, but with two other investors. And as you say, it's not Bowley now who tends to run it on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a guy called Baydad Egbali for Clear Lake, who now appears to be in charge of the day-to-day -day running or the strategic decisions at Chelsea. But as with Bowley's time at the club, in the short term anyway, that doesn't appear to have been particularly any more successful so we'll keep an eye on that one that is an, an interesting situation particularly as some of the spending decisions that have been taken by both Bowley and Egg Bali over the last few years are going to have ramifications going forward for Chelsea. Huge ramifications and this is why um, I mentioned earlier on um, Martin Salmon at the Sunday Times there are others as well who've got this rather sort of crass vulgar view well I got your money get your cash out spend it as much as possible yeah but when you're putting people on nine-year contracts that stretches well beyond your own ownership it stretches into a future where maybe there isn't a private equity fund around to spend billions on uh, those types of contracts and fulfilling those types of contracts and leave clubs in a very exposed very difficult position down the track and the question really is is does one care about clubs getting into financial difficulties and going bust if one doesn't if one takes an ultra capitalist view of it like samuel does and basically says well you know if clubs go bust so be it doesn't really matter it's okay come one come all there'll be another club to take its place and so on and so forth etc then that's fine i mean that, that that is a legitimate view but it's not a view that i think most football fans instinctively instinctively feel comfortable with there's a great sense of I want this club to be around for my children and grandchildren. I, Even if we're not European champions, even if we are a bit less good than we have been over the last few years, I still want Chelsea to be there. Um, and that's why I think these UEFA SCRs are really, really important. That's why I think that um, having a government regulator is really, really important because ultimately it is a game and the game is meant to be fun and it's not much fun watching your club go bust as you and I have experienced in the past. Indeed. If Martin Samuel would like to come on the podcast, by the way, I'd love to have him on. Uh, we share a musical taste for a band called The Nightingales, I know for a fact. And uh, I think in lots of his writing, Martin Samuel is a very witty and very clever writer. But on this, I tend to agree with you and not with him, but it'd be great to have him on the podcast. So Martin, if you're listening, do come and join us one week. Now, as we're speaking, Charlie, it's just ahead of the first round of games in the Women's Championship. The WSL starts in a couple of weeks' time. There is big change afoot in the world of women's football. As I understand it, there was a report compiled by Karen Carney, the former England player, and that recommended that women's football should no longer be run by the Football Association, but there should be a new co, a new company set up to administer women's football and we're moving towards that transition now is that right well th th this is going to be a subject for a much longer discussion on another day adrian um because th this is one you know where i've got strong views on being somebody who you know is also running a, a women's football club in the championship our first match this weekend um etc um so newco as they call it imaginatively has effectively started Right. So we are now operating not under the aegis of the FA, but under NUCO. The problem is, is with their customary um, lack of foresight, the Football Association has created in NUCO effectively a monster for somebody else to try and sort out. Um, and that's a result of the Carney report, which I'm afraid, for all the best intentions in the world, has about all the business sense you know, of of my daughter's paintings that she's currently doing 
just to my right here, it is it was a catastrophic report. Um, had no sense and idea of how women's football can develop professionally, really. It just basically sought to try and copy the men's game as much as you possibly can. Um, and it, it's almost this sense of that women female players of that generation resented the fact that they didn't have the same setup as the men's professional game and they want to try and copy the men's professional game. The problem is, is what they've done is they've copied all the men's professional game's mistakes and faults. And um, the the lady who has been appointed to run Nuco, who's a very able, good, decent person, is being landed with the horrific task, effectively, of trying to make this work. But that's a subject for another day, I think, is that there's a, there's a lot of detail that goes into why um, we're in the situation we are. And, and, and as you say, it's the start of the Women's Championship. If I was to tell you that, they, that the, the vast majority of teams in the Women's Championship do not want to win that competition, it will give you some, some sense of the size of the screw-up which the Football Association and the Carney reports have left the game in. Well, we will talk more about that in a future episode. The woman who is now running the new co, uh, the Women's Professional League, is Nikki Doucette former director of Nike. They've got an all-female executive board. And as you say, Charlie, probably driven by the very best of motives. I simply observed that the, the WSL, even though there is a championship, which is part of this structure, the WSL is 100% in charge of all the negotiations around broadcasting and sponsorship. So that we, we see a replication of the Premier League's control of the money coming in to men's professional football into women's professional football. As you say, we'll part that for now, but we will return to that. And if you've got strong feelings on that, know something about it, and you're listening to this podcast, by all means do drop us an email to goldbergradio at gmail.com. Before we go, Charlie, I want to talk about one of the most controversial pricing decisions that has emerged this season, which is Aston Villa's pricing for their forthcoming Champions League campaign. Of course, Villa's winners of the European Cup in 1982. They've not played in the Champions League in its modern format. The cheapest tickets for a game at Villa Park in, in the, I guess, in the Holt end, the kind of traditional area behind the goal, if you're a season ticket, is £70. It is £85 if you don't have a season ticket, and the poshest seats cost 97 quid if you're not a season ticket holder. If you're over 66, so a pensioner, even if you've got a season ticket, the cheapest ticket is £65. Villa fans are absolutely apoplectic about these prices. Yeah, um, and, and these are things that we see now on a very regular basis, aren't they, Adrian, as clubs try to keep up with the Joneses um, you know, keep up with sort of the levels required to be able to sustain themselves in this sort of crazy world, high octane world of um, the top end of club football. Uh, my observation would be that you know last year Aston Villa lost around a, a ra around about a hundred million pounds, um, and when we say they lost it, that means the owners funded it, um, and effectively. That massive investment by the owners of 100 million pounds has built a team that gained Champions League football, and in that spending, they were applauded all the way by the Villa fans, saying, "This is amazing! What great owners we have! This is fantastic!" And this is the this is the morning after, this is the hangover. This is guys, look, if you want to be fans of a Champions League club which is what you say you want. It, you, you're not in the goldberg methven world of sustainable football, of accessible football. You are absolutely on the big, vulgar cash money train here. And that's what you said you wanted, big signings. We're the Villa, we're a massive club. I imagine you hear that a few times in Birmingham when you're out and about, Adrian. Well, bully for you, fantastic. Just be careful what you wish for. Well, Just let's say careful. about this, Charlie, is that, uh, you know, of course Villa fans want their club to do as well as they can. But you look at other clubs in the Champions League, Celtic, for example, I think are charging £46 for their Champions League games. That's still not an inconsiderable sum of money for many people in these times. But £46 is a lot cheaper than £70 per game. And surely the broadcasting 
revenue and the sponsorship revenue from being in the Champions League will go a long way towards meeting Villa's financial commitments. Well, the no, amount of money... But they, they've just lost extra, £100 million. Pounds. The amount of money extra, though, that they will get from peeing off their supporters is minimal, isn't it? Adrian, the, they've, they've, just, they've just lost £100 million. Pounds. That's not sustainable. Um, and the club needs to start to do things that brings that into line. Now, I think where, where these things do tend to go a little bit wrong is the lack of consultation. And, you know, I always say the thing about running a football club is about priorities, about determining between yourselves and your supporters what the priorities are. Is your priority to have cheap seasons, cheap ticket, cheap ticketing, cheap prices, accessibility, or is your priority actually being a competitive side? Now, Celtic, that you've just mentioned there, don't really have to stretch that far themselves to be top dogs in Scotland. They're huge. They're, by, by comparison with anyone other than Rangers, they're obviously miles bigger. And therefore, they can afford to be relatively modest in their sort of spending compared to their revenues because their revenues are 10 times the size of other clubs that they're competing with most weeks, except for Rangers. In Villa's case, you know, they're, they're competing against Chelsea to get that Champions League place and future Champions League places. And if they keep on losing £100 million a year, they're going to get points deductions and they will not be in the Champions League anytime soon. So it's a very difficult one to work your way around. I think as a club chief executive, generally speaking, what you want to do is you want to sit down with your fan group leaders and say, look, this is where we are. This is how we're seeing things. Would you rather that we cut back a bit on wage spending to give you guys slightly cheaper tickets? Or would you rather pay the higher ticket prices for us to be truly, as part of a package of us being truly competitive? At least that adds a sense of responsibility into the whole thing. Because what I do find distasteful is when you see fan groups who absolutely begged for the big spending, then saying, well, but surely we shouldn't pay anything. But why would we pay anything? To watch Champions League football, we're, we you know we we never said we wanted Champions League football. In Villa's case, they 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 did. Yeah, the fans have been very clear for a long time. We want the club to show ambition. We want them to be big big dogs again. This is the price, Charlie. Thank you, and thank you for listening. If you want to read more, head to my Substack, adriangoldberg.substack.com. This episode has been edited by Jed Thomas, and thanks to Mark Machado for our socials at 11.29. We'll see you again next week, but for now, thank you. Do spread the word. Cheers now. Bye-bye.